Senate Public Health and Welfare Committee to order. Um, first up, I had a new sheet in front of me that I'm supposed to let you know that if anyone is presenting slides or sharing testimony, please send all relevant files to audio video requests at las.ks.gov and with the correct committee in the subject. And also anybody attending via WebEx, if you have a question, um, please use the uh, hand raise function inside of WebEx. So with that, do we have any bill introductions? Mike? <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Mike O'Neill, uh, appearing today on behalf of the Kansas Justice Institute. Uh, we request bill introduction on 22 RS 2381 dealing with uh, exempting um, those engaged in the practice of eyebrow threading from the provisions of the Cosmetology Act. Okay. Committee, you've heard the request. Are there any objections to this bill being introduced as a committee bill? Seeing none, that is introduced. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do we have any other bill introductions? Okay, I don't see any, so we will move right into our presentations on interim reports. And first up is our Kansas Senior Care Task Force, um, Irata Orr. Good morning. Irata, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I understand you all have an electronic copy of this report, so I will be hitting the highlights for you. Um, this, uh, for a little background, this uh, Kansas Senior Care Task Force was created by House Bill 2114. It was a 2021 law, and it has a sunset date of June 30th, 2023. It is composed of six legislative and 16 non-legislative members. And the appointing authorities were required to provide notice of their appointments to the Secretary for Department of Aging and Disability Services. The um, legislative members include the chairperson of the Senate Committee on Public Health and Welfare, a member of the Senate Committee on Public Health and Welfare appointed by the President of the Senate, and a member of the Senate Committee of Public Health and Welfare appointed by the Minority Leader of the Senate. On the House side, the chairperson of the House Committee on Children and Seniors is on the committee, as well as the ranking minority member of the House Committee on Children and Seniors and the member of the House Committee on Children and Seniors that's appointed by the Speaker of the House. There are multiple representatives from various agencies and um, stakeholders that are represented um, in the, among the 16 members that are non-legislators. Uh, they include an elder law attorney, long-term care ombudsman, um, representatives of adult care homes, of community mental health centers, um, Alzheimer's Association, all sorts of different groups that have an interest in the topics related to seniors and their care. Um, the structure and organization of this committee um, was such that um, they are working directly with KHI, who is providing facilitation services in the way of um, working groups that were created for this committee. On um, the task force sought and requested legislative coordinating council approval to create working groups to assist the task force in studying the topics that were assigned to it. And at the December 7th meeting of the task force, um, the final working group charter was presented by KHI. The two working groups are quality of care and protective services, and then access to services is the second group. And there's a subgroup created for the workforce issue. This subgroup is made up of members from both of the other two groups. And the primary areas of focus for each of these groups are the quality of care and protective services addresses the administration of antipsychotic medications to adult care home residents the safeguards to prevent abuse, neglect and exploitation of seniors in the state, and adult care home surveys and fines. And access to services addresses the provision of care for seniors in the state who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and other age-related mental health conditions, and the funding and implementation of the Kansas Senior Care Act, 
and senior daycare resources in the state, and rebalancing of home and community-based services, which I will probably reference as HCBS. So um, if you would, um, if you hear me say that, that's what I'm referencing. The charge that was given to this committee is um, that directs the task force to study topics on the provision of care for Kansas seniors who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and other age-related mental health conditions, administration of antipsychotic medication to adult care home residents, safeguards to prevent abuse, neglect, and exploitation of seniors in the state, adult care home surveys and fines, funding and implementation of the Kansas Senior Care Act, and senior day care resources in the state, as well as rebalancing home and community-based services. The working groups have begun to meet. They started in December of 2021 and um, have continued to meet. As a matter of fact, uh, there are working groups meeting this morning, uh, beginning at 9. They meet, um, the two working groups will meet twice a month for 90 minutes each time. Uh, all the meetings are scheduled from 9 to 10.30. And then the subject matter working group that's working solely with the area of workforce issues is work, meeting once um, a month and will be um, meeting also for the 90 minutes. The LCC approved four meeting days for the task force, and they met on September 9th, November 11th, December 6th, and December 7th. And the members met both, both met both in person and on WebEx. There were several topics covered at the September 9th meeting. First was an overview of the authorizing statute for this committee and a presentation of the Open Meetings and Open Records Act, which we thought would be helpful since there are so many non-legislative members. Um, the working group concept was discussed by KHI and presented, and they discussed how they work with the groups to while remaining neutral, direct their conversations and um, discussions to come up with uh, recommendations for the task force. Also provided was an update on the senior care services and programs and state plan on aging by the Secretary for Aging and Disability Services. And she discussed the aging population and stating that the U.S. Census estimates in 13 years for the first time in history Older adults, ages 65 and older, are expected to outnumber youth. And by 3030, when all the baby boomers are 65 years old and older, they will make up 21% of the population, up from 15% of the current population. And Kansas currently has a population aged 85 and over that's expected to expand from 63,000 approximately in 2014 to 230,000 in 2020. 64. So it's a growing population with issues that this committee is tasked to address. The secretary also talked about the Older Americans Act, which is, excuse me, a federal act that provides services for um, seniors. She shared the five goals of the program, which are outlined on page six of the report, and discussed um, several of the grants that are available. The um, Title II provides grants for several programs, and then Title Four, excuse me, Title VII supports elder rights protections, including long-term care ombudsman, prevention of elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and the State Legal Assistance Development Program. She discussed the programs for which um, oversight is provided by KDADS and then discuss the Aging and Disability Resource Centers, which are to be considered as a one-stop shop for senior issues. It's available to anyone regardless of income, and it's implemented through 11 area agencies on aging. Uh, the uh, purpose is to uh, provide assistance in planning for future long-term services and support needs. And the, these same uh, aging and disability resource centers provide functional assessment necessary to determine eligibility for home and community-based services. They also provide the care assessment that's required for admission into the nursing facilities. Secretary discussed the frail elderly and the brain injury waiver, which are two waivers uh, that are most likely to be used by the senior population. She mentioned the fair, fair, frail elderly waiver has no current waiting list and then discuss the brain injury waiver and the changes made to that so that those with an acquired injury can also be uh, able to receive services. The um, secretary discussed the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly, which I think most of you probably recognize as PACE. 
and the services that it provides. Uh, it's only available in spe specific service areas of the state and uses uh, day services to keep people living in their own homes. She then discussed the Senior Care Act, which is a Kansas-specific program established in 1989 that assists older Kansas who have functional limitations but are able to reside in their home and the community with support services. And this program is also implemented through the 11 area agencies on aging across the state. In this program, seniors direct their care and may choose their caregiver. One um, note that the Secretary, Dep Deputy Secretary of Programs for KDADS discussing this topic mentioned was the staffing shortage that exists um, for this program to provide these services. And she noted that there was funding for fiscal year 2022 that will increase to $10 million, but the staffing shortages could mean that extra funding may not be spent. Um, there are about 300 to 400 persons currently on the waiting list for the Senior Care Act services. There are also presentations from uh, Kansas Legislative Research Department on the fiscal history of the Senior Care Act, and there, those are available and summarized in your report. We received a presentation on the 2020 Alzheimer's Disease Plan and the status of those recommendations. And it was noted that every 65 seconds, an individual in the U.S. develops Alzheimer's disease or other dementia. And currently in Kansas, there are about 54,000 persons ages 65 or older living with Alzheimer's or other dementia. And the number is expected to increase to 62,000 by 2025. There's, um, Deputy Secretary said that in consideration of some of the public health crisis with Alzheimer's and related dementia, the Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Task Force was established in May 2019 by Executive Order Number 1908. And she discussed those six recommendations made by that um, council. Presentations were received on adult care home surveys and fines and surveys or the inspections. So um, if you hear the word survey, that's what I'm referencing. Um, the Secretary for, uh, Deputy Secretary of Hospitals and Facilities at KDADS talked about the Survey Certification and Credentialing Commission within KDADS that inspects and licenses adult care homes. There's a separate division that inspects those facilities that are only state licensed. Um, the Deputy Secretary did note that um, there is um, a lack of surveyors to um, take on the duty of these inspections. And some of that reason for that that was noted is that it's a difficult position to fill. There's a lot of travel involved. And Kansas uh, doesn't use licensed practical nurse or other lesser credentialed nurses used by some states but uses uh, registered nurses because they can exercise an independent, more independent evaluation. As a result of those inspections or surveys, fines are assessed both by, can be assessed by the state and by uh, Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. And those civil monetary penalty funds are placed in a fund and are used to provide um, quality initiatives, projects that will address help for these of seniors. The CMP funds or civil monetary penalty funds were reserved um, and were used when we had 22 receiverships. These were nursing facilities that were unable to um, continue to provide services under their current condition, whether it was financial, staffing, um, other issues that had occurred. And so um, those were used to maintain those and keep them um, running. Of those 22 facilities, only one remained still under receivership. And um, that one, I believe, was uh, they were attempting to sell that facility as well. We heard presentations of data on antipsychotic use and drug, antipsychotic drug use in nursing homes. And um, we heard about the process used by the three CanCare managed care organizations. Aetna Better Health of Kansas, Sunflower State Plan, and United Healthcare Community Plan. And uh, they provided a chart that contained information regarding the number of patients receiving antipsychotic medications. 
Persons with diagnoses of schizophrenia, Huntington's disease, and Tourette's disease um, receiving antipsychotics are not included in those totals, as those are typically prescribed for those individuals. And Kansas has been at about 15% quarterly prevalence of antipsychotic use for long stay residents for several years. We had an opportunity to, in the committee to hear presentations from individuals, providers, and organizations. Uh, several topics that were discussed were the um, support for uh, 2021 House Bill 2004, which would assure protections from involuntary discharge from adult residential facilities. Um, there was also mention that there's been loss of home care and hospice agencies, especially in rural parts of the state. Um, workforce staffing issues were mentioned. And there was also concern um, about the need to focus on supporting families, um, especially prior to entering uh, the, funny, the uh, institutional care for their loved ones. We heard, um, had discussions at each meeting regarding what recommendations might be, might be considered by the committee and what topics they would like to discuss for the next meeting. At the November 10th meeting, we heard several responses from um, KDADS regarding questions were posed at the prior meeting. Uh, one of the things that is, uh, kept coming up during the meeting were the need for some mapping to be done to show where the senior population is in relation to the services that are available. And uh, as a result of that, the Deputy Secretary of Programs provided some interactive maps um, that were created by Wichita State University Center for Economic Development and Business Growth that, that set out some information regarding these populations and where they were located. And um, that was one of the recommendations that uh, was being considered by the committee was the need for those mapping services. We also heard presentations on the distinctions between nursing homes, nursing facilities, assisted living, home plus, and senior daycare facilities. Um, they described, um, KDADS described the hours of operation, the level of service provided, and the oversight, and those are outlined in on page 12 of the report. There was discussion about the involuntary discharge laws at the time, and the uh, KDAD's Deputy Secretary of Hospitals and Facilities clarified that the right to appeal an involuntary discharge or transfer from an adult care facility is afforded to a resident in a federally certified nursing facility and um, found under the residence rights sections in federal law. There is no corresponding state statute or regulation that affords residents in, of adult care home licensed only by the state the same right. We heard about the MCO's process for appropriate, uh, the appropriate use of antipsychotics and the methods they use to address those and had a discussion from the Deputy Secretary of Programs from KDADS about rebalancing, which is uh, of home and community-based services, which essentially just means providing alternatives to institution, institutionalization. And CMS defines rebalancing as achieving a more equitable balance between the share of spending and use of services and supports delivered in home and community-based settings relative to institutional care. The states are required to provide institutional services but HCBS services are optional, and Kansas opted to provide those. Um, home and community services did not include the, room, the cost of room and board. The Deputy Secretary of Programs also talked about the rate structure um, in managed care organizations that they're held to, and stated that the rate structure holds the MCOs accountable and incentives um, strengthening the HCBS incentivizes strengthening the HCBS system because it's more cost effective for the managed care organizations to increase the number of individuals receiving home and community based services than to provide nursing facility services. We heard from then from medical doctors about the use of antipsychotic medications and when it was appropriate and not appropriate to provide those types of medications to an individual with dementia. Those are found on page 14 of the report. We had a discussion by a neurologist and co-director of the University of Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Center regarding the interaction of mental health, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. And um, then we had a presentation from the regional director for Department of Children and Families discussing the adult protective services. And um, 
mentioned that four state entities investigate the allegations of adult abuse, uh, Department for Children and Families, Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, and the Office of the Attorney General. Then they discuss the invent investigative process used by DCF when there's allegation of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. With regard to the calls received, the DCF Regional Direction Director mentioned that self-neglect is the highest type of substantiated case and financial exploitation at this time is the lowest. We also had a presentation from the Deputy Secretary, uh, excuse me, Deputy Attorney General from the Fraud and Abuse Litigation Division of the Office of Attorney General. And he provided the process used by their office to investigate um, adult abuse, neglect, and exploitation. There are presentations made by uh, Kansas Legislative Research Department that highlighted some of the caregiving strategies and staffing programs used by other states to address workforce shortages. It was noted that it's too soon for some of that data to be available. At the December meeting, we began to summarize what had happened during the previous meetings and to come to some sort of recommendations as a committee. The, the committee received a presentation on the formularies for psychiatric medications and step therapy that impacts the senior population. They discussed the preferred drug list, step therapy, and in, which is informally described as fail first. And then um, we proceeded with an overview of community mental health services that were available. And um, those were provided by the Association of Community Mental Health Centers of Kansas. Their presentation on efforts to address workforce shortages by the Deputy Secretary of Hospitals and, and, and Facilities at KDATS. And um, they, the Deputy Secretary did note that the um, KDHE and KDADS joint home and community-based services FMAP enhancement spending plan, the uh, federal matching um, medical assistance percentage enhancement plan, would be, um, had been submitted to CMS and that the agencies are waiting on full approval. They, KDADS expects to draw down approximately $80.3 million in additional federal match. And of that, the final investment portfolio designates $57.1 million spent on workforce. The Director of Community Health Services, the KDHE, uh, then um, talked about how the agency identifies the areas of the state with health professional shortages, discussed some of the programs to address that. We heard from the MCOs about their efforts to meet network adequacy as a result of the workforce shortage and then had presentations from those managed care organizations about efforts at rebalancing home and community-based services. At the last meeting date, we had um, public comments from consumers, providers, and stakeholders. We had the long-term care ombudsman to speak uh, on behalf of several individuals residing in long-term care facilities who had provided statements. Um, we were unable to get them there in person or via uh, WebEx but she um, discussed those and read some of the comments from their testimony. There was a presentation on the survey process and deficiency levels and fines, and then um, we heard the same from a provider perspective. Some of the comments from the providers is that the survey process is highly regulated and punitive system of multiple government agencies providing oversight of the facility's work. And they suggested um, instead of a punitive model of regulation, there should be a quality improvement model using a collaborative approach. We heard from the Kansas Guardianship Program a presentation about their work in recruiting citizens who are willing to uh, be appointed as guardians or conservators for persons who don't have someone in the family or a close friend who can assist them when they become unable to make decisions for themselves. And then we had the final um, version of the working group charter presented and adopted by the committee. The conclusions and recommendations section on the last page of the report outlines um, just a few of the things that were that were discussed by the committee at each meeting. Um, they were encouraged to provide some of their recommendations. 
in advance and to think through some of those. And there was a long list provided, some of them overlapping, but the members of the task force um, did, after discussion, agree to have the following recommendations. They mentioned that KDADs should reach out to universities for assistance in mapping the various senior services across the state. This is to address um, the need to better understand where the population is and where those services are available to them. And the legislature should explore the possibility of using temporary aids in long-term care. And that um, idea for that was to assist with the staffing shortage that exists in long-term care facilities. The, another recommendation, a request should be made to the Legislative Post Audit Division of Post Audit to perform a limited scope audit, less than 100 hours, to determine where broadband funding, including federal funding, has been spent in the state and to identify the differences between urban, rural, frontier regions of the state. Uh, this was in uh, relation to concern expressed about the lack of broadband accessibility in uh, rural parts of the state and that, how that impacts their access to care. Another recommendation, KLRD should research the funding for broadband in the state. And the final recommendation, the legislature should seek funding to produce a new Kansas elder count book, including a digital version. This request was made because there was a discussion of a 2002 Kansas elder count book, which had the projections on the number of seniors that who would need services by county. And they felt that that information would be beneficial to update that report and to have that available to them. Of the topics that um, were, not were not addressed as a recommendation, many of them were sent to the working groups to further discuss. Um, those included the involuntary discharge from the state license only, only nursing facilities and the appeal rights for those individuals. Um, the need for reliable broadband was again stressed to look into that further. And the use of antipsychotic in nursing facilities and services for younger onset Alzheimer's individuals age 60 and older. Um, and then rebalancing, excuse me, under the age of 60 and then rebalancing the home and community based services. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Irida, thank you very much. Committee, do we have any questions for Irida? I do not see any. You must have done a very good job explaining. So thank you very much. Committee, next we have uh, Matt Moore, Matthew Moore. He's going to give the 2021 Special Committee on Home and Community-Based Services Intellectual and Development Disability Waiver uh, Report update. Matthew, welcome to the committee. Morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matthew Moore. I'm a fiscal analyst with Legislative Research. I just want to provide you a very brief overview of the report of the Special Committee on Home and Community-Based Intellectual and, I and Developmental Disability Waiver. Um, the committee met over two days in October. Uh, we heard testimony from the agencies on eligibility for the waiver as well as the wait list in general for waiver services. We heard from uh, stakeholder organizations as well as uh, families with individuals on the wait list. Uh, we then also heard testimony from providers of HCBS services with regards to uh, workforce shortages that they faced. And on the, on the final day on Friday, we heard sort of some testimony from the agencies on budget neutrality, as well as uh, the reimbursement rates and funding for the waiver. Uh, on the final day the committee met, we made approximately 10 recommendations. I won't go into each one specifically, but I wanted to kind of provide a brief, quick overview. Um, those 10 recommendations sort of fall into three categories. The first being kind of further study of the waiver, the second being funding for the waiver, and the third being sort of the structure of the waiver. Um, in that first category, the major recommendation that was made was the first one that the committee made was for the LCC to consider approval of a task force or a committee similar in structure to the 2020-2021 uh, Mental Health Modernization and Reform Committee with, with the working groups. Um, for kind of further study of modernization of the waiver. Kind of the second major 
um, sort of study topic uh, that, the, that the committee recommended was that KDAD sort of look at the targeted case management rates, which is a service on the waiver, and how those rates compare on the waiver with those on other programs, such as the uh, STEPS program with KDHE, and provide those funding, those um, findings to uh, several committees. Um, additionally, the the committee was interested in receiving uh, sort of a report from KDADS uh, on sort of the current needs of individuals on the wait list. Uh, there was some testimony that. Uh, many individuals on the wait list might have not have been reassessed for quite some time. And so they were interested in getting kind of an update, have those individuals reassessed, and then present those findings to the, the legislature, as well as separate from that, receive sort of uh, an assessment of individuals on the wait list to kind of get a better idea of, idea of the needs of individuals both on the wait list and on the waiver. Sort of the second group was that were funding kind of recommendations. There were uh, a few recommendations for KDADS to review the rates for several specific um, services on the waiver, sort of make some recommendations to the legislature for potential increases for the waiver, uh, those specific uh, sort of services. And then the next one was sort of a, um, uh, a broad recommendation for uh, funding uh, for the IDD waiver uh, that would then be provided um, to providers uh, for sort of increases in direct support salaries. Um, and then sort of the last one I'd like to touch on on funding would be for the legislature to sort of identify uh, areas within the budget that they can reduce expenditures to then have some funds available to provide further uh, funding for the IDD waiver. The last sort of group of recommendations I'd like to touch on are sort of the structure of the waiver or kind of the authority of that uh, the waiver's under. Um, the, the sort of major recommendation that the, that the committee made was for this legislature to sort of study other states, um, how they um, have structured their waiver um, to, uh, in hopes of reducing the wait list in Kansas. Uh, currently in Kansas, the, wa the waiver is what's termed as a comprehensive waiver. That means if you're eligible for services, you're eligible for all of the services on the waiver. And we heard some testimony that there are maybe some potential other ways that we can have a, kind of structure the waiver that, that might provide um, kind of individuals to receive not all of the services, but services that are more targeted towards their specific needs. Um, the sort of second kind of structure uh, recommendation was for the legislature to consider providing individuals who self-direct their services so that they don't go through an agency or uh, another organization to get their services, uh, to provide them with individual budget authority that would allow them to take the funds that they receive for those services and kind of more target those towards their individual needs. Um, the final recommendation I'd like to touch upon was in terms of the structure of the waiver is for the legislature to explore possibilities to uh, provide kind of automatic annual adjustments for the IDD waiver reimbursement rates. Um, and that was also an item that was sort of uh, tagged for if the LCC did approve a committee that the committee could sort of uh, review that, um, the automatic adjust annual adjustments as well. Um, and this is a kind of a very broad overview of all the recommendations. Um, you should have an electronic copy of the, of the report. Uh, like I said, there was a lot of good information that was provided at the committee. Um, it goes into a little bit more depth in those following pages. So uh, with that, I would stand for any questions. Okay, Matthew, thank you very much um, for that update. Committee, do we have any questions for Matthew? Senator Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matthew, uh, is the wait list still right around 4,000 or so for the IDD people? Uh, so Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, I checked this morning the wait list as of December uh, 2021 is uh, 4,622. Okay. Uh, one other quick follow. I know one of the issues that some families have is the, the timing of when they get um, the, the the assistance for the IDD, particularly when you have 
kids who are in school, they, they you know, it's difficult getting, uh, say, some after school care while the parents are still uh, at work and things like that. I mean, did you address that in some of these studies and how people can be flexible? And this, in smaller communities, I know that's, that's a big problem. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I don't recall any specific, that specific topic coming up. I know that there were, were some discussions of individuals who were on the wait list that, and kind of the struggle to receive services and kind of waiting years for those services. But in terms of um, individuals uh, on the waiver um, and any sort of kind of scheduling issues, I don't recall anything coming up in the committee. I do know it is a little bit of an issue in some rural care because I have a family member who, who deals with this. And uh, so I'm just kind of curious about that situation and whether or not the you know, future uh, discussions might include, you know, because it's not sometimes the amount of care, but it's more about the timing of the care uh, where, where they need the help in that regard. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Gossage. Thank you, Matthew. Having served on this committee, I remember when we made this list of recommendations, and perhaps you can enlighten me when the list of recommendations are made. For example, the legislature study how other states have addressed this, and we specifically made that, but then who does the study? Can you tell me how that works? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I my understanding is so that these were sort of recommendations made to the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that was a potential item that, um, you know, whether that would a committee were to take that up or if that would be a topic that the, should the LCC approve the sort of mental health modernization-esque committee uh, would kind of take that topic. Uh, but that would, would have been a topic that, you know, if a committee, you know, this committee or another uh, health-related committee could potentially take that item up, uh, whether that would be entail you know testimony from the agency testimony um, from providers or you know other individuals that might have sort of that information or whether or not that would involve sort of research requests from us and that could be a topic for a committee or uh, you know this uh, special committee if the LCC approved it thank you senator Baumgartner thank you very much mr. chair thank you Matthew for being here today could you share with us, um, so it was addressed that the current needs on the wait list need to be evaluated. When was the last time KDADS actually went through that wait list to evaluate the needs? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I don't believe that there was a specific date of when KDADS would have made that sort of reassessment. Um, it, during the committee, it was sort of discussed that you know, individuals receive that assessment when they're put onto the wait list, and it could be you know, some time before they receive a reassessment, which generally would be about that time that they would be, at, be taken off of the wait list onto the waiver. Uh, so it could be years between that initial assessment and a, a reassessment. Um, and I don't remember any, any specific date given of the last time that KDADS provided a a you know, broad look at every individual on the wait list, but it's more of that they're assessed, put on the waiver, and then they are reassessed once they receive the waiver, which again could be several years between those points. So it's quite possible that several of these people, um, you know, we're talking about 4,600 Kansans, have not been reassessed in at least the last three years um, that Secretary Howard has been overseeing KDADS. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, that would be my understanding is there's not a general kind of continuing reevaluation of those needs on the waiver. Okay. Wait. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matthew, I don't see any further questions, but I do, do have a comment for the committee. One of the things that on this uh, interim committee that we discovered was there wasn't a good tracking system of when someone uh, was put on the waiver list outside of name, address, and phone number, and date of birth. That was about all that um, the state KDADS kept. So there was not a breakdown of this person needed 
X service or Y service. It was that was just the basic information that they had. So um, that was I know the committee was of great concern to address. So I just wanted to throw that out. Committee, no further questions. Matthew, thank you very much. Okay, committee, uh, that does wrap up our agenda today. Um, just a reminder, tomorrow we will have our first bill hearing, Senate Bill 42. Um, and then the following week, we will have, um, on Tuesday, we'll have two bill, bill hearings. And I apologize, I do not have the bill numbers. I, I know one's 121. Um, and then Wednesday will be a continuation of the bill number that I don't have yet. And then Thursday is, um, I believe it's 353. Let me double check real quick before I tell you that. That way you got everybody on the committee can review those bills and have their questions and concerns ready to go. Um, and I'll give you that other one real quick. It's on Thursday. I apologize, it's Senate Bill 343, 343. Okay. Senator Thompson. I, I missed that one. I think it was a 121. Senate Bill 121 on Tuesday, and then Senate Bill 343 on Thursday, and then there's another bill, and I don't have the bill number yet, on Tuesday, and it will continue into Wednesday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Correct. 343, not 353. So, all right. Nothing else to come before the committee. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.